don't know if your video is to say bandwidth. And Sal, just unmute yourself and you can take it away. Okay, but we don't have full screen, do we? Uh, no. Let's try it again then. Here we go. Now we do, right? Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, uh, welcome back to the final edition <laughs> of the Earth. <laughs> this, um, I, I want to just say that uh, in in putting together a class like this, um, I think about my experience in watching a lot of documentaries and reading different books about it. For, from my world of security, it was important to try to look at this broader picture, Just, again, to put into context the events that were, are taking place that ultimately manifest itself in um, conflict, warfare, crime, that sort of thing. Um, and as I look at this material, uh, there, it, it's like with any academic study, there's a whole language that you have to learn first. And it really makes it difficult to get into the topic because, you know, we have the galaxy, we have the universe, we have um, the stars and the solar system, how do they all relate to each other? What do they mean? And uh, if you're not up to speed on that, it's easy to get lost in it very quickly and your eyes sort of roll over. You know, what is the cosmos? I thought it was a kid I grew up with in Brooklyn. Um, anyway, there's all of that getting adapted to that terminology. Uh, I think unfortunately makes it difficult to view some of the documentaries if you're not up to speed on it and to really follow it through. So in putting together this, I really wanted to do it not using all of the terminology uh, and to really get it on a very high level to sort of just understand the concepts of how our current environment came about. How did we get here? And also to add perspective about how long the earth has been here so that when we listen to the news and they say, this is the warmest day ever, uh, <laughs> they will say in recorded history or whatever, but it, we really think it's the hottest day that has ever been on earth. And that's just not true. So it's to put it into perspective, to add more, uh, widen the frame out uh, uh, so you get a broader uh, view. And, 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 and I would say that that is a theme of really all of the stuff that I uh, study and the classes that I put together are aimed at providing more context so that um, it's, it, 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 it protects against the manipulation of just cherry picking um, words and phrases to complete a narrative that you wish to use to define the Civil War, the Revolution, World War II. Instead, instead of just trying to manipulate it is to try to give a broader picture. Of course, whenever you're putting together a class, you are selecting information from a wide range of things, and it's still subject to manipulation, but hopefully it's put into a broader context so that it can be challenged. Um, we've gone through, um, you know, these different phases of uh, the development of Earth from a, a, a cloud of dust and rocks into a crust that's covered in water and is uh, ice uh, reaching up to 10,000 feet, uh, and then a warming period where life begins to emerge, and there's, uh, there is a surface above the water 
and continents start to uh, form. Uh, and, and we talked about how, you know, life did emerge underwater and eventually comes uh, above water. Um, and that it gives birth to the dinosaurs uh, that rule for uh, 120, 30 million years, uh, followed by the, the uh, terror bird who rules for 60 million years. Um, and us humans eventually emerge about 300, 200 to 300,000 years ago, but we are connected to ancestors who are at the root of our existence going back 10 to 12 million years. Um, this phenomenon of global warming that we're going to talk about is really a product of the past 500 years. And uh, that is with, you know, the, the coming of Columbus and the industrial world. Many of us view the industrial world as being a phenomenon that emerged in the mid 18th century. Uh, and as you know, in many of my classes, I've argued that industrialization began long before that, only instead of industrial machinery, we had humans who were the machinery uh, for what became industrial level uh, production of commodities and, and, and things like it uh, that made people very, very wealthy. Um, but over that 500 years, the expansion of industrialization really uh, gets on steroids. And it begins with the discovery of coal uh, off the coast of England. Uh, when coal is identified, and coal is a sedimentary rock uh, that is comprised of, uh, of fossils, uh, dead plant life, that kind of thing that, that, that uh, uh, decays over time and then forms into a solid. Uh, and what makes coal so significant is that it burns more efficiently uh, than wood. Up until the middle of the 18th century, wood was the source of, uh, of, of, of uh, warmth and of fire. And uh, when they discovered coal, they had something that was much more condensed that gave off a more intense heat and, uh, and, and lent itself to what became uh, mechanics, machinery for industrialization. It's from coal that we start to de develop steam technology, mechanical systems driven by steam. Uh, and so the industrial revolution uh, is, is kicked into gear. When you start burning coal and other fossil fuels, such as oil and others, it adds to the carbon uh, dioxide in the atmosphere. And if you recall, when we were snowball earth, when we were covered in ice, it was because ro rocks that were, uh, you know, above the water were able to absorb the uh, carbon uh, dioxide that was released through volcanic activity. And when it was absorbed by the rocks, it didn't form an atmosphere. That meant it was very, very cold. Um, over time, the rocks become covered with ice. And so when more volcanic activity took place and released more carbon dioxide, now it wasn't absorbed by the rocks and it went and created an atmosphere. And so that atmosphere begins trapping the uh, sun's rays, the heat from the sun, and the planet begins to warm um, and doesn't really get into a point where uh, it's suitable for life until about 450 million years ago. 450 million out of the 4.6 billion years. 
so one tenth of the time <laughs> that uh, the earth has been here has been an environment where life could survive. And, and it is uh, really then, so it's important to understand the role that carbon dioxide plays. When we started burning coal, however, it starts adding a lot of carbon dioxide beyond what was released by volcanic activity. And as a result, we have a significant global, global warming taking place. And so we're heating up. And there are people who would say that uh, we've always had climate changes. And so it's just part of nature that's taking place and we need not become overly concerned with it. However, if you recall, we looked at climate changes that took place over millions of years. And now we're looking at dramatic changes taking place over 500 years. So uh, there's an accelerant that has taken place and scientists have concluded that it is human activity that has caused that escalation. Uh, let's now uh, take a look at this. Mind you, uh, Al Gore has been uh, ridiculed many times for his uh, positions on uh, 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 global warming. Uh, and it's important to say that Al Gore uh, is, it has at no point said that it's his scientific research. He has said, scientists have done this research. I'm merely presenting it to you. Kind of echoing the theme that I uh, feel is uh, important. So let's take a look at his film, An Inconvenient Truth. Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth, won him an Oscar. And yet, much of the movie is nonsense. Sea levels may rise 20 feet is absurd. Even the but IPCC. This is Al Gore. He always goes down the road of hyperbole. Not only is he losing the argument on climate change, but he's losing the science as well. You don't go see Joseph Goebbels' films to see the truth about Nazi Germany. You don't want to go see Al Gore's film to see the truth about global warming. And it's the most severe winter storm in years, which would seem to contradict Al Gore's hysterical global warming theories. Now, Donald Trump says he's had it up to here with Al Gore and is calling for the Nobel Peace Prize Committee to take the prize away. Yes or no, do you believe that human-caused global warming is a moral, ethical, and spiritual issue affecting our survival? Yes, I do. Uh, yes or no, do you believe that reducing fossil fuel-based uh, uh, energy usage will lead to lower greenhouse gas emissions? Basically, yes. I don't think we, that's, I that's think that we can. Senator uh, Gore, if I that, could just... Uh, well, you can. not Now, it seems that everything is blamed on global warming. Last summer, we had a heat wave, and everyone said, oh, that's proof it's global warming. Then we had a mild December. Oh, that's proof uh, that it's global warming is taking place. Now, I, I, I wonder, how come you guys never seem to notice it when it gets cold? The National Academy of Sciences here in this country and in the uh, 16 largest or most developed uh, countries in the world agrees with the consensus that okay. I've stated. To Senator you. Gore, if I, if I could, my time has if, almost expired completely. Are you aware of that? Uh, it seems that well, I everybody like uh, on I, global I warming in the media uh, joined the course Excuse last me, summer. Senator Inhofe, how no. can you ask a question and not give a man a minute to answer? Please. Uh, Senator. Uh, thank you. Um, I was sitting here trying to think what I could do or say that, um, that, that might make it possible to reach out to you. And I, I, I'm serious about this. Um, I'd love to um, talk with you without the cameras and without the lights. 
and uh, and tell you uh, uh, why I feel so strongly about this. Session. I've been doing this a long time, and I was reminded recently of how long it's been since I started this. I was sitting in a restaurant. A woman came walking by in front of my table just staring at me. And I didn't think anything of it until a few moments later I saw the same woman coming from the opposite direction <laughs> just staring at me. So I looked up and I said, how do you do? And she took one step forward and she said, you know, if you dyed your hair black, you would look just like Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, thank you. And she said, you sound like him too. <laughs> One of the comedians on TV said recently, the way you know global warming is real is if the hottest year ever is the year you're currently in. 14 of the 15 hottest years ever measured have been since 2001. The hottest of all uh, was 2016. This graph shows average temperatures from 1951 through 1980. The white are the normal days. The Blue are the cooler than average days, and the red are warmer than average days. And in the 1980s, the entire curve shifted to the warm side. And we saw, for the first time, the appearance of a statistically significant number of extremely hot days in the lower right. In the 1990s, the curve shifted further. And in the last 10 years, the extremely hot days have become more numerous than the cooler than average days. We still have cool days, we still have cold days, but these extremely hot days are becoming much more numerous. In April of this year, the temperature over Greenland was much higher than normal. An engineer on one of the helicopters took a video during this temperature spike, those are parts of the glacier just exploding with the high temperatures. Ridge here. Yes. That gray line is where the ice surface was back in the 80s. Not so long that, ago. Not long ago at all. It's amazing to think that just 30 years ago, where we are right now, it was all covered by the big ice sheet. I think uh, a lot of us are a bit uh, shell shocked by some of the changes. It's, it's a little bit hard to believe. So where's all that water going? I'll tell you where some of it's going. It's going into the streets of Miami Beach, Florida. High tides continue to bring a flood of frustration. Fort Lauderdale gets the award for the something you don't see every day video, fish swimming on Cordova Road. Experts say in 30 years or so, a drive along Ocean Drive could be a drive in the ocean. Downtown Miami could be a wash. This is a temporary pump here. All customers, you just can't help. Oh, that's supposed to stop the water? It keeps it back as long as possible, but it's not very effective. And what happened is with these new high tides that came in, this is, you can't do anything for it. 
So it's going to get worse and worse as the tide comes up. We're right. showing you an area that hasn't been actually fixed at all, as you can tell. And then on Wednesday, I think we're going to get together. We're going to show you some of the areas that used to be like this. They put in the mute, mute. Road, put in pumps. We've seen dramatic results. And it's yeah. so much better. Yeah. So you raise the road with saltwater resistant materials? Yes. And what level of sea level rise is this uh, designed to protect against? We are building in about a foot of sea level rise. And um, I'm sure the projections are going to continue to move. Kind of hard to pump the ocean. Why we yeah. gotta raise above it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. This is not a uh, not a simple fix. Yeah. You know, you can only raise so much before you change everybody's lives around here. Yeah. Scott and I grew up here, and this wasn't the case 40 years ago. So we, if anyone wants to argue that it's not happening, <laughs> it, it's happening. <laughs> it's yeah. happening forever. Actually, the atmosphere of the Earth is a very thin shell surrounding the planet. And of course, right now, we are putting 110 million tons of heat trapping global warming pollution into that space every single day. We're using this as an open sewer for all of the gaseous waste in our global civilization. Agriculture is a, a big cause of it, burning of forests and burning of cropland. But still, the main part of the problem is the emission of carbon dioxide from the burning of coal, oil, and gas. And that builds up heat energy and raises temperatures. India just set their all-time high temperature record in May, 123.8 degrees Fahrenheit. The streets are melting. We have built a civilization for conditions that we are now in the process of radically changing. All-time records have been broken this year in Thailand and in Cambodia and Laos. In Pakistan, over 1,200 people died in the heat wave there. This year, they have dug anticipatory mass graves for the people they fear will die in this year's heat waves. And we are seeing that the higher temperatures are shifting the balance between microbes and human beings. The transportation revolution has a lot to do with this, air travel, but the climate conditions have a big impact on that. Let's look at Zika. Here is the range of the one mosquito that they're most worried about, and warmer conditions increase that range considerably. But here is the kicker on this. It's not just the mosquito, it's the virus. And the warmer temperatures speed up the incubation rate inside the mosquito. So we get an explosion in the number of cases. And now it's spread to Miami, Florida. And for the first time in history, pregnant women have been advised not to go to part of the United States of America. In many areas of Central America and South America, the doctors are delivering a message that I've never heard in my life. They're telling women, don't get pregnant for two years while we try to get a handle on this. That's something new in the history of the human race. How long can we just sit back and say, oh, well, maybe some genius will think up some miracle? I'm sorry, I'm getting all uh, fired up here. But let's step back and take a global view of the increasing temperatures and the extra heat energy. 93% of all this heat energy is going into the oceans. And it has several consequences. A direct consequence is that when ocean-based storms cross much warmer ocean waters, the storms get stronger and more destructive. Just a few years ago, Superstorm Sandy in the Atlantic crossed areas of the ocean nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal. 
and it caused tremendous uh, destruction in New Jersey and in New York. And by the way, 10 years ago, when the movie An Inconvenient Truth came out, the single most criticized scene in that movie was an animated scene showing that the combination of sea level rise and storm surge would put the ocean water into the 9-11 memorial site, which was then under construction. And people said, that's ridiculous. What a terrible exaggeration. Something happened last night at one of the most iconic locations in New York, the World Trade Center, Ground Zero. A flood of water with a current so strong, it flooded the reconstruction. There is a wake up call here, and that is climate change and our vulnerability to it. And so um, Al Gore's crazy uh, stuff turned out to not be so crazy. Um, New York was indeed flooded and um, it was a major catastrophe. Um, now, one of the um, uh, interesting aspects of all of this is some of the uh, early research uh, into global warming uh, was conducted. Somebody has their um, has their microphone open. If you could just check to make sure you're all muted, that would help. Uh, is some of the um, early research was conducted by Exxon. society, improving human lives, raising standards of living, and enabling unprecedented economic growth. What do you do when your industry can no longer exist without creating catastrophes worldwide? The impacts of climate change are intensifying. It's important to understand the past. You can't understand where you are if you don't know how you got there. In a special three-part series, the epic story of our failure to tackle climate change. The whole world is heating up. And the role of the fossil fuel industry. Did big oil knowingly spread disinformation? Now in part two, how big oil continued its campaign of doubt. I could assert to you that I don't think this has happened. Lee Raymond is salient because he's hammering away the idea of scientific uncertainty, even as the science grew more certain. And the political struggles overtaking action. We do not know how fast change will occur. There just was no appetite, economically, politically, to go forward with a cap on carbon. My brother Charles and I provided the funds to start the Americans for Prosperity. We had a multifaceted, hard-hitting approach. <laughs> pressuring Republicans who are weak need and Democrats who are vulnerable. This was the end of climate legislation in the U.S. Congress for a long time. We had a shot at it and we got beat. We continue to maintain a position that has evolved with science and is today consistent with the science. We won't solve the climate crisis unless we solve the misinformation crisis. It's convened by the American Petroleum Institute. Exxon is in the room, Chevron, Southern Company, with various think tank officers, communications professionals, and right-wing libertarian professionals. They're hatching a plan to stop people from worrying about climate change. Less than a year earlier, some of those in the room had helped block American participation in a major international attempt to combat climate change. They feared more threats on the horizon. 
The plan is a wide and concerted effort to install uncertainty around climate science, to decrease political pressure by sowing doubt around the science. Their targets include media, members of Congress, school teachers, average citizens. The plan right at the top says victory will be achieved when recognition of uncertainties becomes part of the quote conventional wisdom. They said that it was never implemented. But what it shows is an intentionality. We need people to not care so much about climate change. We need uncertainty to rule the day. Our country faces a big choice about the future. We are truly at a fork in the road. With the help of Congress, environmental groups, and industry, we will require all power plants to meet clean air standards in order to reduce emissions. The new millennium began with a presidential campaign. One candidate had long advocated for action to combat global warming. In this election, the environment itself is on the ballot, and there's a big difference between us. I'll never put polluters in charge of our environmental laws. His Republican rival was an oil man from Texas, who was also talking about action on climate change. I mean, look, global warming needs to be taken very seriously, and I take it seriously. Both of us care a lot about the environment. We may have different approaches. During the campaign of 2000, George W. Bush put out a, a position paper and a speech and a statement saying that he was all in favor of putting limits on carbon emissions. And he was in favor of all kinds of government measures. It dampened the sharp contrast that I had thought was going to be very clear. Whenever there's a transition of power in Washington, D.C., there's a great deal of talk about a change in the culture as well. Bush had pledged that he would place a national limit on America's carbon dioxide emissions. Governor Whitman reflects a growing consensus in this country about environmental policy. She and I share the same point of view. Once in office, President Bush tapped Christy Todd Whitman to run the Environmental Protection Agency to turn his pledge into action. We had talked about it before I accepted the position. Some sort of a cap on carbon that limits the amount of emissions is what's critical. And the president agreed with me. We were on the same page. I thought that this was our opportunity, that we could really get it done. And uh, uh, Christy Todd Whitman eventually had to resign her position because as she went off to international meetings to negotiate, uh, she found when she got back <laughs> that the uh, administration was not supportive of it. The Bush administration's U-turn was a victory for big oil, especially ExxonMobil. Its CEO, Lee Raymond, was close to the vice president, who had been an oil industry executive himself. These men were business associates. They were friendly. They were part of the same fraternity, the oil fraternity. You're rolling. Yes, sir. As chairman and chief executive officer of one of the world's leading energy companies, Lee Raymond has helped to improve the lives of countless people all over the world. And as the head of a major science and knowledge-based corporation, Lee understands the critical importance of science and technology to continued progress and economic growth, both at home and abroad. I've been investigating the fossil fuel industry for decades. And Exxon was a ringleader. And they were at the center of the campaigns that were around in the late 90s, early 2000s to stall climate policy. 
Exxon had emerged as the real bully on climate change, headed by Lee Raymond, who was a hardened denier. Number two, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to comment on the findings of fact about the relationship between the burning of fossil fuels and uh, climate deterioration. I understand that a corporation's policy is that this uh, remains in the realm of the unproven, but I would like to state from the broad scientific community that this is, in fact, a well-established uh, fact. There is no convincing scientific evidence that human release of carbon dioxide, methane, or other greenhouse gases is causing or will in the foreseeable future cause catastrophic heating of the Earth's atmosphere and disruption of the Earth's climate. Lee Raymond is salient because he kept hammering away the idea of scientific uncertainty about human activity driving climate change, even as the science grew more certain. There is a substantial difference of view in the scientific community as to what exactly is going on. I could assert to you that I don't think this is happening. My mind is open enough to say, I'm going to listen to the science. From 1998 to 2014, Exxon alone put over $30 million into think tanks that were proffering uh, uncertainty, that were questioning the climate science, questioning policies that were being proposed, really casting doubt on anything to do with climate change at the state level, at the national level, and internationally. I started working at ExxonMobil shortly after the merger. At the turn of the century, they were making on the order of $5 billion a year. Geoscientist Bill Hines had spent years studying past climate change before joining ExxonMobil. This is the first time he's been interviewed about his experiences at the company. I'm disappointed, I'm angry, I'm disenchanted at the duplicity exhibited by ExxonMobil to say one thing internally and to say a different thing with a much different consequence in the political arena. He'd been hired to use his expertise in climate change to help discover new oil deposits. My ambition when I joined Exxon was to keep doing my science. And I was blown away doing all kinds of really interesting earth science research at technical levels above what was happening even in top universities. And not only was it appreciated, but it was for a reason. People need energy to live, and we were providing that energy. Hein says scientists at the company had developed a deep understanding of climate change and the role of burning fossil fuels. This was real fundamental earth science. We really tore apart how does the earth work, and climate is a really important part of that system. So you got to understand the climate system to search for oil and gas. The fundamental idea that we put CO2 in the atmosphere and that makes the temperature go up and that's bad, everybody understands that completely clearly. He says he quickly saw signs of a disconnect between what he and his colleagues knew and the position the company wanted to stress. Shortly after I joined ExxonMobil, there was a presentation by Art Green, who is the chief geoscientist of ExxonMobil Exploration. All the scientific staff were there, and Art got up and gave his presentation about how ice core records were unreliable, and here were temperature excursions in the past when there couldn't possibly be any human influence, and here's all these reasons why we really don't have to worry about climate change. He didn't clearly state it, but the subtext appeared to be that his bosses didn't believe that climate change was something to be concerned about. There was kind of stunned silence in the room. And ExxonMobil is a very polite place. In that context, the reaction was quite remarkable. Translated in modern parlance, if my children were explaining the reaction, they'd say, are you nuts? <laughs> no. We don't believe you. We're scientists here. We, we, don't want to, we don't want to hear this stuff. Get this uh, ready. 
Just be a second here. Planet Earth drives geology and geology. Okay, so, uh, oh, but wait, let me uh, first do this. Just, yeah, wrong one. Sorry, stop that share. Come back here, share this one. Okay. And so uh, just um, uh, some points, which is that when we look at what's happening with the atmospheric carbon dioxide, just looking at a graph from 1960 to 2020. So we're looking at uh, 60 years, you can see there's a dramatic increase, almost a hundred, uh, uh, million parts per million of carbon dioxide in, in addition to what we had been doing in 1960, a very substantial um, increase. Uh, we have, you know, we're facing the threats of global warming during our existence. However, it's important to understand that scientists are also saying today there are there there's a subset of scientists who are saying look it really doesn't matter because there's an ice age coming and it will wipe out everything that you're doing which suggests that the uh, real issue is between now and then how uh, miserable will uh, life be for humans while while we are still uh, outside of the list of the ex ex extinct species. Let's have a look at what they're saying. It's the environments in which life thrives. Our first major challenge will be the climate. At the start of the 21st century, we may worry about global warming, but most scientists recognize that we are in a gap between ice ages. Our whole civilization has occurred in a brief warm period 10,000 years so far. This warmth has proved crucial. It's definitely not a coincidence that civilizations developed over this period of time, because the climate is so favorable to our species to develop and flourish. The period we live in the moment climate-wise over the last, let's say, 10,000 years is exceptionally stable. It's an almost unbelievably stable if you, if you look into the geological record. It certainly will not stay forever like that. Even if our industrial economies affect a global warming over the next couple of centuries, they can do no more than delay the inevitable. The continent's current positions, keeping the polar oceans cool, mean that in just 15,000 years, a new ice age may occur. The New York area is going to be completely changed by the next cycle of glaciation. And at some point, glaciers are going to move down and grind New York into the North Atlantic Ocean. But even if we survive the big freezes, there will be greater challenges to come. As plate tectonics move the continents and end the ice ages, coastal regions will be engulfed and whole countries will disappear. 200 million years from now, a new supercontinent, Pangaea Ultima, is due to take shape as first the Mediterranean and then the Atlantic Ocean are swallowed up. There will be continents eventually colliding with the east coast of North America. So New York in the long run will be destroyed in a continent to continent collision and will be uh, completely crushed and thrust upward as a new mountain range. The earth will once again be thrown into deadly turmoil 
oxygen levels and surface temperatures could fluctuate wildly and lead to new mass extinctions. But even the trauma of supercontinental disruption is nothing compared to what will follow. Everything will grind to a halt when the plate tectonic engine finally stops. The maintenance of habitability on this planet is involved with the plate tectonic cycle. It's not an infinite cycle. There is an end in sight. It's billions of years from now, but we know eventually the system will wear out. The fires and the depths that have dominated activity on the surface will one day use up their fuel. And the story of planet Earth will be over. Without its burning heart, the Earth will share what many believe was the fate of Mars. The atmosphere and oceans will be stripped away and the surface will become a bone-dry, barren desert. The planet will be dead. But this is a picture of an incredibly distant future. For at least the next billion years, as the Earth continues its epic journey, some form of life should continue. But the human species, which have walked the Earth for over two million years, and mastered it only in the last 10,000, may be endangered. As the environment transforms, Earth could well become unfit for humans. If that happens in the distant future, rather than be forced to face extinction like our predecessors, technology may allow us to leave Earth in search of new homes, other blue-green planets on which to make a new start, leaving planet Earth to continue its amazing journey without us. Okay, well, um, I, I think this leaves us with some important questions, um, which is that the inevitable will happen, and that will be the ending of this environment as we know it, which is uniquely suited for our kind of living organism. Um, and the, the question is between now and the end, um, what will it be like? Will we uh, embrace what was the human experience before the Neolithic age where we cooperated with each other, where we played nice in the sandbox with each other? Or will it be more of the uh, uh, pursuit of greed and the inhuman uh, suffering that uh, goes with it? Uh, so I think those are questions for our species to, uh, um, to contemplate and debate. Uh, with that, Lauren, we can uh, open up for comments, discussion. Okay. Um, you guys can um, use the raise the hand function to ask questions or make comments or uh, throw your questions into the chat area. And uh, this is, how do they know we're going to go into a, another ice age? Uh, again, they make it up. They're, they're, they're just, they don't know. It's just uh, they thought it would sound good for the ending of that video, which, by the way, that video uh, came to us from George. George found this in, in uh, How the Earth Was Made from Smithsonian. No, uh, you know, it's, uh, again, following the science of, you know, what has happened historically, what have been the, 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 the changes of climate, not you know, was it cold yesterday, but really looking at it over a truly scientific uh, uh, long period. Now, you know, people other than Sean Hannity, who actually never did get out of college, um, I think he went, I think he went a semester. But, um, and you know, he like, and, uh, Sean Hannity likes to say that he went to NYU. I think it was one time when he was getting drunk in the East Village, he stumbled onto the campus. But, it, you know, so he tries to suggest that he does have a higher education, but he doesn't. Anyway, it's not taking science 
from people like Sean Hannity or commentators on Fox News, but scientists who are actually doing calculations and uh, uh, you know making reasonable projections for what's ahead. So inevitably, global warming may make our life miserable between now and the point in time that an ice age wipes us out. There's the good news. Hey, uh, Maxine, what do you got? Uh, well, I guess I pretty much landed where you just said it. I had heard in one of the programs, the bad, you all may have read the book, The, the Moral Animal. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, reading it with my group. And I must say, it's um, not very hopeful. <laughs> so, so you may have scientists doing one thing, but given the amount of uncooperativeness or meanness, I think that's what we're seeing. It's just not going to happen in time. Yeah, I, uh, I, I mean, I'd like to look at it as greed is really the disease that infects our species. And that you're right, what you have are very powerful forces uh, who are not going to give up things that are making them extraordinarily wealthy, no matter what the consequence. And they will, they will uh, recruit into their service um, the public relations industrial complex to make people disbelieve their eyes. I, you know, it is such a powerful tool. The ability to manipulate the masses is, is, a, is a phenomenon that I think is as significant as understanding the phenomenon of global warming. Because we cannot deal with global warming if this other phenomenon is so powerful that it makes us incapable of accepting reality not just on global warming and our whole political structure. It is, uh, it is. Well, are we seeing it right now? Of course we are. Mm -hmm. And we've been, but, but the thing that I, that, that I find troublesome is that we, we, we really depend very much on news to give us the story. And they, and I think that they give us the story as it's happening right now. What they don't give is perspective, a broader picture. So we think that the phenomenon of the Trumpism lies is a thing that occurred over the past five years. Mm. It's a product of the past 75 years, maybe 100 years. Why do you keep longer. saying 75? What happened? So World War II. World War II, uh, the government ran manufacturing in America and produced the weaponry that defeated Hitler. The industrial barons and the former slave masters were terribly threatened by that. America came out of the war very proud of itself, very proud of its government. The slave masters and the titans of industry were threatened by that. It knocked them right. off their perch of power. You're talking about the federal government having power. The federal, absolutely. Yeah. So they were going to fight back to, to drive wedges between Americans so that we would not love our country. We would hate our country. Wait. We might even get to a point where we would conduct an insurrection against our country. That's what <laughs> they wanted. That's what they have been working on. Now, that's a big statement you're just making. Well, what that's, is, that's what they got. That's they what, have been working okay, on yeah. it. It didn't just happen. They have been working on it for 75 years. They, want the, they, they do not want democracy. They have been against democracy forever. And so what I'm saying is, you know, these kinds of classes are to really say, let's widen the frame. Because when you widen the frame, you suddenly discover that it doesn't matter who gets elected this cycle. That's a, it's a, it's a, it's a micro event. The macro event is playing out. And it's a, it, 
you know, it's, it's, it, you have to understand the problem to be able to fight it. And, and if you don't, and you, we look at, well, if we just get this guy elected, this thing, everything will be fixed. But right, so what, when you're talking, it filters through my head as states rights versus federal. And delete, and what's happening now with even tampering with the election system and electors, um, it's, it's pretty effective what they're doing. It can change the whole system. Yeah, look, look, states' rights versus the, you know, the, 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 the federal government is one aspect, it's just a tool that was used by the people like John C. Calhoun. John C. Calhoun said all this stuff about common good, taking, you know, uh, uh, making sure we take care of all of the American people, that's nonsense. It is this, we, there are people who are meant to be rich and there are people who are meant to be poor and you're looking to change the natural order of things. So when you look at things like uh, we have to fight against universal health care. Well, what, why? It would be to the common good. No, it's not to the common good to those who think I want to have that as a lever of power over the masses. That's why we lose. I, I will not allow a cap on insulin. I don't care if people die. So, I mean, it, you must, it, it is imperative that you see, we all kind of have this, this sense that we have a shared sense of value. We value human life. We value each other. Most of us do, but the, there are people of extraordinary power who absolutely do not. They will poison you. They will, they will poison the air. They will watch you die in the street. They do not care. It's only about how much wealth they can accumulate to themselves. And, and that's a hard, bitter thought to accept. But <laughs> I'm sorry, you, if you read the history from the very founding of America. You know, uh, what was it? Rick Santorum said, all oh, those Native Americans, they were just a few of them and, and they were happy and went away. We slaughtered them. <laughs> that's what we did. And it is, it, it, there's a truth and there's a reality. And if we cannot deal with truth, you cannot solve these kinds of problems. But then I'm proud. Well, I think I'll go to bed again now. Bye. <laughs> Colonel Ferris, what do you have? Well, Sal, I just happened to read an article uh, from the Washington Post. Uh, it was 11.04 this morning. It says, Arctic warming happening faster than expected. Study finds the sobering backdrops as U.S. climate bill nears passage. And it goes on further to say, as U.S. lawmakers move closer to voting on a major piece of climate change legislation, recent studies and world extreme weather events are providing steady, study, steady evidence of global warming intensifying impact on the planet. I just thought it was kind of yeah, yeah. What you're talking about is, is, is current news as well. Yeah, no, it, it, what, you know, as we looked at the film, they talked about, you know, how, oh, uh, Al Gore says oceans will, you know, rise and cover 20% of the land mass. That was back when he did his film. Today, science says 30% of the land above water today will be underwater by 2050. Underwater by 2050. So, uh, you, you know, th th what that is saying is for anybody who's got grandchildren and all of that, when they, are, when they are in 2050, you can expect, you think we have world wars going on now? When you take away 30% of the land mass, that means all those people are going to be looking for a place to go. 
we are going to be slaughtering humans uh, <laughs> at an industrial level of, of warfare. It, it has to happen. The Pentagon already knows. The Pentagon has already done studies and says this is what's coming. So yeah, it, uh, right now in, in Miami, they showed you what was happening you know, with the water not being able to. Right now, my, you can go for a week without rain. And one day walk out in the street and the streets are flooded up to your knees from the water that's pushed up <laughs> from the ground. It is, uh, we're, this is, it is a dire condition. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Berry. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I just, uh, um, so I'd like to bring things up to date a little bit. Um, and so I think the reality of the situation is that there are not going to be, uh, isn't going to be enough sufficient alternative energy to move away from oil and fossil fuels for a while. Um, if you look at lithium production, there's not enough lithium in the world to make the batteries needed for electric vehicles for a long time. Um, we've seen the failures of alternative energy sources during extremes. And so oil and fossil fuel companies have to continue to exist. Obama, President Obama threatened to uh, kill the coal companies, which he did. And President Biden has, in his campaign, uh, threatened to kill oil companies. And they are smart people. They realize their future. And so the same companies that were um, criticized in the videos you showed now realize their future. And they're investing millions, billions of dollars actually in carbon capture. And they see their future as moving toward clean energy. And I think it's important to say that we should not be villainizing those companies because we're going to need them. And they're making efforts to be good citizens. Um, you can talk about the billions that they make. You have to. You can punish them with taxes. When nobody was driving over the pandemic, oil was at a negative. They could not give oil away. Did the government supplement them then? They didn't. They took those losses. So you can look at the windfall profits that they're making now, but maybe that balances the two years that they that nobody was driving. It was a glut of oil and oil prices were negative. So I think we vilified them, but I think the reality is we can't live without them. And I think they're trying to address climate change through carbon capture. Some of them are actually opening solar panel, um, solar energy fields. So I think it would be worth your while to actually look to see what oil companies are doing these days. Okay, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I would really want to encourage you to put together a class on that topic to show how the oil companies are really doing their best to protect the environment and meet the needs of, of of the world population. Um, I receive many times uh, newsletters that are gonna, you know, make the argument that carbon capture is the answer, that we cannot come up with alternative uh, uh, energy sources. And, and, I've, and I have chased that rabbit a couple of times simply to show how bogus the research information was that it was that that it would that it didn't stand up, and so I'm open. I mean, I go and I read this stuff and I listen to it, and I'm open to hear it. 
But what I look for is for someone to actually present evidence to, you know, put together a class to give me the sources where that information came from so that I can digest it and I can then challenge it. But from all that I have looked at, when Exxon was making $45 billion in profits and, <laughs> and, and Lee Raymond was leading the George W. Bush campaign, <laughs> it shows to me that the investment is in buying politicians. And George Bush brought on Christy Todd Whitman with a commitment that we were going to do something about carbon. And then as he sent her off <laughs> to meet with the international community, he got a visit from Dick Cheney and Lee Raymond. Oh, so that was 20 years ago. It doesn't matter if it was 20 minutes ago, it happened. And so I, I all, you know, again, I present my evidence. I would like really for a class because it'll take that long to really present your stuff. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying it would be really uh, worthwhile and interesting, and I would like to hear it. Thanks. Okay, uh, Joe. Me? Yes, hi, Joe. <laughs> hey, Sal. Um, this is a short comment. Uh, I was, uh, I agree with your perspective on uh, global warming. Um, just a few, few years ago, remember Tom Brokaw called the generation that fought World War II the greatest generation? Why, unfortunately, I think my, my generation that is, um, and it might be called the worst generation, not only in American history, but in human history. We were the generation that had the responsibility of turning around destruction of the entire world, and we've blown it, I'm afraid. Um, and it's, it's, it's really sad because, and I, I would include, I'm using the word generation loosely, and I would include other people in my generation around the world. Um, but Am I being too pessimistic about that? Uh, no, uh, well, I, I, I would, you know, <laughs> thanks, Joe. That's a good segue so I could promote my class for winter because uh, I'm going to do one on a class on Trumpism. And a major part of that theme is how is it we got from the greatest generation where 70% of Americans polled said they loved their government and they trusted their government in, at the end of World War II to today where 17% say that they love their government. How did we get there? What happened? It's not about the generation, it's not about the people. It really is about a very small number of people who uh, were threatened, they were very powerful. They, they lost it, the Great Depression uh, undercut them. The uh, uh, Nazism really uh, impacted them. And they then, after the war, in fact, starting during the war, they began a public relations campaign to say the American government didn't win World War II. We did. We did. Our manufacturer, of course, you know, 70% of all manufacturing government oversaw it during World War II. <laughs> um, that's not, I'm not advocating for government control of uh, industry, but it is true that during a war in desperate conditions, that's what needed to happen and that's what did happen and that made the greatest generation. So what they did is, is they, they, and they decided that their ideas were not gonna get public support. So they had to do stuff by stealth, underground, 
so that it would be secretive. And they have been very effective. It's taken a long time. They had a lot of starts and stops. Some things worked, some things different, didn't. But in the final analysis, they have been successful and we see it on January 6, 2021. That's just the culmination of it. But there's many more uh, points along the way that I think we need to look at, we need to understand so that we can understand how we got to where we are today. Good. But I agree with you, Joe. Yeah, it's, uh, it is a dramatic change from where we believe we're all in this together. World War II. Uh, it, the people across the board, if you, you were either a veteran who fought in the war or you, were, you made sacrifices here, being a Rosie the Riveter, uh, saving every piece of aluminum foil, saving every string, not, you know, uh, 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 abusing resource. I mean, Americans, remember Americans during World War II, right? They, instead of taking coffee from the GIs, they, they, they drank chicory. What was it, that, am I saying that right? Chicory, right? It was, it's everything was for the war effort. We were all in it together. And then we get to a, a pandemic, a deadly virus, and we're not all in it together. We can't join together to fight a virus. Something happened. And I think we need to look at what it is that happened. My, I mean, but, uh, but that's why, but to explain it all and to present my evidence, I need a whole play. I need a series of eight classes and a, you know, a written paper and all of that so that you can find that I'm not just making it up. Thanks, Joe. Okay, sure. Joy, take it away. Okay. Um, first, with respect to what happened, what happened was Vietnam and the lies, Iraq and the lies, Afghanistan and the lies, and not having a purpose for any of those, and I'd include Korea with that. But I want to give a little historical context. While I agree with you, the greed is a principal motivator, if not the principal one. We have to look at it historically, too. This is not, nothing new. Science versus the powers that be. You know, the Catholic Church fought and just excommunicated people who were scientists. You know, alchemy was outlawed. Science, you know, because the powers that be didn't want to listen to it. So I don't think we've changed all that much. It's just we've changed the powers that be. Yeah, and you know, I, you know, certainly I agree with that, which is why, you know, I mean, I take my thing back to, you know, 200,000 years ago. So we can have an understanding that our species wasn't always greedy and grubby. We got a lot, we knew how to survive and, and how to work as teams. Uh, we, th there was no such thing as the rugged individualist. You had to be before the discovery of agriculture and all, the human ex existence experience was dramatically different. Then we get introduced to property possessions and all of that. Okay, and it changes us. And I think we need to understand. And so I agree, it's, it's not something new. It is, it is grown over time. It is to say, I think we need to understand the problem before we can solve it. And, and, the, and the iteration from World War II is just the latest iteration uh, to try to you know, put in context the, 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 the phenomenon of Trumpism for that class. But I certainly, and I, and I will say that in the class is that it goes back to ancient times and that uh, 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 it, that's there, that's, that's the problem. So yeah, no, science I, I, I based. Yeah. Science based on fact and alchemy was just trying to find the facts is very threatening to anybody who wants to control the narrative. And oh, I don't right. think that's ever going to change. Right, 
right. Look, you know, you have people who are going crazy because they served a search warrant and they're doing an investigation. Well, the last time I checked in my industry, the security industry, we do investigations to determine is there a reason to charge someone with a crime or not? <laughs> we also find exculpatory evidence that says, oh, oh, so you were authorized to put that in your account. Great. I did, we didn't have that. We just saw that $100,000 went from your department into your personal account. And we thought you embezzled it. But now that we see that you have this signed off by the chief executive officer, there's a whole different thing. And see, we didn't make a big deal out of it. We didn't charge you with anything. Nobody else knows about this. So your reputation is intact. That's what investigations are for. <laughs> and when we indict you, that's when we're announcing we think you're a crook. <laughs> but that's it, investigation. That's what it's about. Yeah. Hi, bud. Hey, bud. Good morning. Uh, we might have to finish up with bud. Right, okay. Um, well, I won't take long then. Um, you know, I've, I've, I hear all the stuff about the, uh, the big corporations, the oil companies and all that. And I, I don't argue with that. The, the fact that I, I think they're largely responsible for, for where we are now. But I wanted to look at this a little bit more on a personal level because it's, it's us that are, you know, it's you and I who are taking advantage of the uh, things that, that oil and coal provide. Um, for example, you know, it's been hot here. If I had to turn off my AC, uh, you know, on these hot days, if I didn't have it, I've, I've been thinking, good grief, I hope the power doesn't go off when it's hot here. Well, look, um, that's the kind of thing we would have to do, actually, if we're actually ever going to get a handle on this, uh, unless this carbon capture thing actually gets to the point where it can accomplish something. We're going to keep doing this because how many of us are willing to get rid of one of our cars and walk to the grocery store instead of driving, um, turn off the TV or whatever. I mean, you know, we're using all this energy that, that, that these carbon things are, you know, contributing to. How much of that are we willing to give up? Uh, I, I think a lot of the responsibility <laughs> will ultimately turn out to lie with us not just the corporations and the, you know, the politicians and so on. Well, I, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't, I, I'm not at a uh, viewpoint that we, we, we have to give up our, um, you know, the way we live and the way we function to make those changes. There's probably alter, you know, alterations that need to take place. I don't, I don't know. I do know that the scientists at Exxon uh, recognized the problem that was coming and were looking at alternatives and were leading the research um, in many respects. They, were, they had more sophisticated laboratories than you had at academia. And so they were, but, but then what happens is uh, Lee Raymond says, no, this could, this, I, we're, we're making a bundle of money right now and I'm going to put an end to that. Well, I and that's what that last sign, mind you, that was an Exxon scientist who was being interviewed there, who was saying, you know, we come together and we have this meeting and this guy tells us, nah, this ain't a problem. Well, we know it's a problem. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what are you talking about? It's not, we're scientists. Don't give it, you know. And so uh, I, I do believe there are uh, ways to deal with the problem. It's a matter of uh, the people who are making fortunes out of the current system 
don't want to let go of that and are doing everything they can and through public relations, putting out loads of, uh, of bogus science and bogus arguments to make people doubt that there is uh, a, a, another way. I, I, I'm, you know, I just, I don't believe that at all. I think there, that we don't have to say, you have to give up your car and you have to turn off your air condition. I don't think that, I don't, I don't believe it's at that, that that's the choice we have. I think the choice we have is, do we look at science and does science come up with alternatives and do we put the effort forward or do we have interests who don't want to see that happen purposefully distract us? Well, um, I wasn't actually saying that we would need to do this today. I'm just saying that it probably yeah. sure. come down the road. But the other, my other thought is that companies like Exxon are the ones who have the the funding to do this research into carbon capture. Um, I think the solution, if, if that turns out to be a solution, will probably come from the people that caused the problem in the first place because they have the resources to do that research and development. And, and they wouldn't be doing it for the benefit of humanity. They would be doing it because they could make a lot more money uh, by solving the problem that they created in the first place. Right. So. Thanks, bud. Thanks. Good. Okay. Great. <clears throat> you want to take one more? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Margita. Thank you. Uh, this is a very depressing presentation, Sal. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting more and more depressing until I'm totally speechless. <laughs> but uh, as to your I, 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 can't, I can't stand living with myself. It's not <laughs> very unpleasant. But now pertaining to the topic of, of climate, uh, I was, as an educator, I would say the only way out of this uh, combating the lies of science uncertainty, which is total baloney, uh, is information getting the information out and then regulating those bodies, those fossil fuel corporations, industries. But how do we get the populace to the point where they vote people into office that can perform these regulations and, and have a more uh, just society as a result is education. So I would say critical thinking in the schools, putting out the facts, creating curricula that are more uh, civic oriented and having a stress on that. And also investigative journalism, we have to counteract these pseudo uh, you know, media outlets. They're just spokespeople for certain groups and parties and lies and have the consumer be smart enough through critical thinking to discern lies from facts, science versus baloney. Uh, that's all I can say, it, it's- Yeah, no, I, look, I think one of the things- Oh, justice, but yeah. no, education no, one, is- One, one of the things to, to that, the points that I wanna make in my future class is that, mind you, this, this, this uh, group of people that uh, wanted to fight back against a united America, and they, 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 um, they, they're radical people, uh, but they operate under an umbrella of conservative. And I want to make that distinction that it does, I'm not attacking conservatives, but there is a group that is radical that calls themselves conservative. And they wanted to promote their, their thoughts. Well, when, when, you, when, you, when you write a, a paper for a, an academic journal, the problem there is that paper has to go out for peer review. So their papers wouldn't survive peer review. When they, uh, <laughs> when they you know, in, in so many, they would be cut off. So what they did is they said, okay, we need to create our own apparatus. We have, we have universities who are teaching these young people 
uh, you know, real information. It's not our information. We want to we want to counter that. So what they did is they created an apparatus of institutes, think tanks that would then publish their papers and give it a veneer of looking like it's an academic journal. They would find people who have PhD after their name, but have no soul. And they would, you know, have them come and they would write a paper and they would make their argument and it you know, could easily be torn apart. But for the mass population, they start to, well, this came from the American Enterprise Institute. It must be credible. It's an institute. It came from the Cato Institute. It came from the Manhattan Institute, all of which were funded by this group so that it would give dignity to their ideas that weren't deserving of dignity. And so this has taken place now over many years. <laughs> and so what you now have is people get information that's coming at them and they don't know, they, it's, it, it's very difficult to discern, is this real or isn't it? Uh, the, 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 one of their techniques was to say, we don't want to go through the journalists because you know, those journalists, they keep asking questions. So what we're going to do is create a direct mail apparatus. So we bypass all of them. Now we have social media and that has replaced direct mail. But what it is, it's we don't want it to go through any filter that's going to challenge our sources of information. And so we're at a very desperate time. Uh, and I don't know what the answers are to it, but um, uh, global warming is just one item that is, uh, uh, has people very confused, very manipulate, manipulated, and um, the scientists are pushed into the background in, in many ways. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks, Margita, good to see you. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. And um, here we go. You can, uh, everybody can unmute themselves. Thank uh, Sal. And thank, thank you, Sal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, when is the next class? When does this full class start? Uh, September something. Okay. 20th. <laughs> oh, 20th. Okay. Yeah, I like the 20th or something. Yeah. Will you record those? Pardon? Will you record the first class? Because we'll be out of the country. We'll okay. be back. Uh, yeah, September 20th um, <laughs> is the first class. And I'm asking if you would record it. I do will you, record do it. Do you automatically record all classes? Uh, yeah. We record things on Zoom. We can't, we're not doing in recording in person just yet. But we're, uh, but Sal's a sure bet because he's always on Zoom. Okay. Yeah. How's Thank that? Yeah. So okay. September 20th, we'll see you in September. There you, see yeah. you in September. When wow. the summer's through. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. I'm going to uh, end our recording.